So our speaker today is Joshua Vlach from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Joshua has a master's degree in entomology from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and has work experience with insect vector control, which I'm assuming is mosquitoes. It looks like it was from Florida, so yeah. Um, and then since 2004, Joshua has been an entomologist with the Insect Pest Prevention and Management Program at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. So welcome, Josh. We'll let you um, take away the presentation. And again, if folks have questions, please use the Q&A box and we will um, have time at the end to answer questions. All right. So uh, yeah, my name is Josh. Um, we have a few entomologists here at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. This is um, you know, a small little lab and a museum here at the, at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And so you're seeing a little corner of it. Um, and so here we do a little bit with the European honeybee, a little bit with our native bees, but the vast majority of what we do is with invasive species work. And that's, you know, like trying to anticipate, you know, what invasive species are moving around uh, that could be pests to our agriculture and forests, um, how they might get here and trying to figure out how we could survey or, or find them early when they got, got here. And then hopefully be able to say eradicate them and keep them from becoming established. Um, and if not, maybe being able to mitigate their, their, um, arrival by like biocontrol or something. So that's kind of like a, a basic thing of, of much of the work we do here. Uh -oh. So um, maybe you do appreciate how, how much in, uh, invasive species that, uh, affect your life. Um, I would say that we deal with them a lot more than we probably most of us realize or think about. Um, so when you think about problems that you've dealt with recently, um, you know, if you're dealing with a pest, say, in a lawn, um, you know, pretty much all the weeds you encounter in a lawn that people treat for are, we are exotic. Um, most of the insects are exotic. And when I say exotic, I mean things that, you know, weren't in this region before humans came, mostly like, you know, in, in Oregon. Because you know, we could talk about being exotic to North America or you could talk about Oregon. I'm generally talking about being uh, exotic um, in Oregon, um, or at least in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, because things in the southeast are also exotic from here, so we don't consider those native to, to our region. Anyway, um, if you're dealing with slug and snail problems, uh, all those pests are exotic. Uh, if you're you know gardening and you've got your vegetables um, and you're having aphids and white flies and scales and things attacking those, most of those are exotic pests. Um, most of the weeds in the garden are also exotic. Uh, if you're having problems with your fruit trees and bushes, Many, many, if not most of those pests are also exotic. Uh, and honeybees, their diseases and, and parasites are also exotic. And so granted, most things we're talking about, most of the things in your lawn, most of the things in your garden, and the honeybees themselves are also exotic, right? But those are things we've chosen. Uh, they're of interest to us, and we are, we are interested in cultivating those, those uh, organisms. And so, but by accident, uh, we have brought the pests of those things that now make it more difficult for us to use to, to use these organisms that we're interested in or to take care of these organisms we're interested in. So, you know, what would life have been like if we'd been more careful about um, bringing pests here? Because we, you know, we were aware that the, these pests were associated when we brought things from these other countries. Uh, it, it would be, have great benefits. I mean, there'd be less pesticides used. Every, every um, time we have a new pest come in, it likely has a chance of, of causing a farmer or, or someone who has their lawn they're taking care of to use, an, use pesticides because it's another thing that, that they don't like the outcome if they don't control it. Um, there'd be less soil disturbance. Um, a lot of weeds, um, are uh, a lot of the, the reasons that we till soil is because of weeds and also some diseases. And so it would help reduce so soil disturbance and erosion, things like that. So just by default, um, organic gardening and farming would be easier, right? And our native bees would be at, be at risk, less at risk. Um, you know, we have maybe 500 species of bees in Oregon, and there are diseases moving around, especially amongst bumblebees, and those are have been brought in uh, by efforts to move in other species of bees, for, usually for uh, pollinating purposes. So just to make you think about the, uh, these things a little bit, uh, hopefully you guys are all aware of the Pacific Northwest Insect Management Handbook. Really good resource. Maybe it's not called a handbook anymore because it's only online. Um, and so what I've done here is this, blue, this is a, a page for blueberry. And all these pests here are the ones that are treated in that book. So probably on blueberry, I'm not exactly sure how many species are known. 
uh, in Oregon from blueberry, I'm guessing 60 to 80 or so. These are the ones that are known to be pests. And so I kind of use the Pacific Northwest Insect Management Handbook as like a, an economic indicator. Somebody actually, it was enough of a problem that someone took the time to write up, you know, how do you, how do you detect this pest? What's a, um, a treatment threshold? Uh, and how would you control these things? And so it, I could use it as kind of an indicator of its importance as pests. So we have about 19 things here, 19 species. And the ones in red are exotic, and the ones in kind of gray green are native things. And so you can see that about nine, nine are exotic, uh, almost half. If we ignore the yellow jackets, we're kind of a weird kind of pest, we would then have more exotics. But regardless, about half. Um, probably the worst pest in here is an exotic, it's a, the spotted wing drosophila that causes lots of problems with all, all of our berries now. So keep that in mind as we go on. Uh, so Douglas fir, same thing. If you go to the, the um, Pacific Northwest Insect Management Handbook, um, these are the things that are listed. There's probably about 80 species on um, Douglas fir in Oregon. Uh, most of them don't cause it problems. But you, so if you think about Douglas fir, it really is, it doesn't have a lot of horticultural varieties. You know, there aren't like white ones and dwarf ones that people buy to put in their yard for ornamental purposes. And so we don't trade it around a lot. It's generally just a forest tree and then somewhat a Christmas tree. And so most of those things are green, right? The, the green ones are native things. So most of its pests are native. We said that one, the brown soft scale, super common um, greenhouse pests. It's on almost anything that gets put in a greenhouse. And so the ones in black are things I wasn't sure about. So, but some things have just been here so long, it's hard to tell whether they're native or not. So I kind of ignored those. But anyway, the vast majority are, are native. And partly that is because there hasn't been a, a lot of trade in things like this. And it doesn't have a lot of close relatives to bring it pests. Because obviously we have a huge resource so here in terms of a pest could get here. There's lots of food. So another example, maple. So right, we have maple species, native maple species, um, but there are lots of horticultural, um, you know, there's lots of species that are, are used in um, ornamental uh, landscaping and stuff like that. And lots of ornamental varieties of Japanese maples and things. So you'll see that in this, in this case, about half again, are uh, exotic species. And in this case, we actually have some that are undescribed that have come in through a post-entry quarantine appears. Anyway, I, I tend to find that if we've got uh, a species that we, we grow a lot and is kind of uh, traded um, in the, the horticultural trade a lot, then you know, you, it does feel like about half the pests end up, of the common pests end up being um, exotic. So they have a pretty big impact. Um, we just don't tend to divide them up in, our, in this way. And it's all, sometimes it's really hard to tell if something has been, is native or exotic because they've been here for so long. So I kind of get the sense that a lot of times oh, I'm talking to people, they'll be like, well, you know, we brought in all these pests, this is too bad. Um, we just have to deal with it, right? It's done is done. And that's true for the things that are here already, for sure. Um, but we keep doing it. You know, we keep bringing in new pests for the things that we care about, things that we want to try to grow, making it more difficult for us to take care of you know, our forests and our agriculture. And, and there's no risk of us running out of pests. There are plenty of pests out in the world for us to continue to bring new pests for a long, long time. So the, here at the Department of Agriculture, we, in 2007, we started, we wanted to be, kind of highlight this more. And so we started recording new species getting established in Oregon in a more detailed way, in a more rigorous way. So starting in 2007. So we have about 113 species from then till now um, of all sorts. These are invertebrates so that includes like snails and slugs um, and mites and things too, not just insects. Uh, the ones in yellow, those are uh, things that when they arrived, we knew that they, they, they were known to be economic pests. And so because they're, um, sorry, just, just take note of that. And you can also see there on the right-hand column, there's those two species of Erythia that are described that are from those maples. And so you can kind of see in that list there in the years, you can see kind of the progression of how we found um, new species in Oregon. And it's jumped around, you know, every year is a little bit different. A low of two, in 2017 of three, high of 21 in 2015. And that isn't so much about how these things are being introduced necessarily. It's more about, you know, there's just a few of us here doing this kind of work. And so it depends on, you know, where is our survey focused, our survey efforts focused, and, uh, and what kind of pest load is there or has been looked before. So there might be lots of new things that we haven't looked there before. Because, um, you know, we have tons of different crops here in Oregon and lots of different uh, habitats. Anyway, this ends up being an, uh, averaging out to about a little over nine species per year that are getting introduced, to or introduced and established in Oregon. So it's just been a steady, steady rise, steady increase in the number of pests that have come. 
And so if you remember those yellow marked um, uh, species in the, the previous list, that works out to be about one in seven of these things are known to be economic pests when they arrive. Um, and that isn't to say that the other ones can't become economic pests, it's just that, you know, they're new to this, at this area, maybe they, they haven't had time to become established. We don't know that they're going to be economic pests yet, it doesn't mean they can't be in, in, in the future. Um, basically, you have this, uh, so if you get a little over nine species per year, and one in seven of the pests that we get tend to be an economic pest, then the odds are really good that every, time, every year we're going to get a new economic pest, right? So kind of bringing this endless parade of new pests. And that might not be a, a plant that you're particularly interested in, but it's a, something, it's affecting something that someone's interested in. So why do, have all, why do we have all these exotic species? I mean, I, I think fundamentally we, we know that we as humans, we move stuff around and that, that's part of it for sure. You know, we've, we've brought, brought plants with us since we've, um, wherever we've gone, especially once you know, grains and things like that, that we wanted to cultivate. But unfortunately, oftentimes we also bring pests and they might not necessarily been with that crop. They might've been stowing away in the straw in the bottom of the ship or something like that. But, you know, over time we've gotten faster and faster at moving, you know, whereas it used to take weeks um, to cross the ocean and a lot of insects and other organisms couldn't survive that trip. It was too harsh. You know, now you can overnight a plant <clears throat> to Europe and, you know, it could be there in, in, or some insects to Europe and just uh, basically overnight. And, um, and there's, there's basically no organism that can't survive the trip now because uh, it can happen so quickly. Another thing that we, historically that we've done is movement of raw wood products. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, we often think of like logs and firewood and sure those, those are definitely ways things get moved around. But probably the primary way is, you know, everything you, that we buy in the store probably comes on a wooden pallet, uh, possibly comes a wooden crate when it comes from over, overseas. And that stuff has definitely been a vector for stuff. Also inside of ships, they brace, as far as cargo ships, they brace the cargo with what is called dunnage. And it's really junky wood that gets kind of stuck in there to keep stuff from sliding around inside the ship. So we know that those are good vectors and have been good vectors and still are pretty good vectors um, for pests. Uh, and it, it's not, not really allowed anymore, but mail ordering bees was one of the things that brought a lot of the pests here. People would, could bring bees over, over the, uh, from overseas. And then once they got here, migratory beekeeping helped distribute everything around. What does get us to is a frustrated entomologist. It's probably too broad. Um, I should probably just refer to myself, frustrated entomologist, because, you know, I kind of, we see our mission as protecting Oregon from new invasive species. And so, you know, if we have nine, over nine species coming a year, it kind of feels like a failure, right? Um, feel somewhat responsible for it. And this is especially because these are, you know, these invasive species, they're, they're forever problems. You know, a lot of our, our human problems aren't forever problems. They're the relatively, sh relatively short term, um, uh, but these are forever problems. And so once they're established and attacking our crops or our trees, the best we can do is to mitigate them. They're, gonna, they're probably gonna be here forever. So what this means is that we've, we've introduced these essentially legacy species, you know, a, a gift to, our, to the next generation, um, which they love very much. And uh, it means that, you know, that, that as these things that are coming in now, once they get established and start attacking things, that then, the, then our kids are gonna have to um, deal with one more pest in the crop that they're dealing with and have one more obstacle to reducing pesticide use or, or to be a grow, grow crop or have a healthy forest or natural environment. So I, I know that I don't wanna sound super pessimistic. I mean, so we do have successes. I mean, we, there are, we are successful at keeping invasive species out. Um, there are laws in place and inspections for plants coming into the country that definitely make a difference and reduce the number of things coming in. Here in Oregon, um, we, we've kept out Japanese beetle for 80 years. We kept gyp, uh, gypsy moth out for nearly the same amount of time. Um, we've eradicated light brown apple moth, a variety of wood borers um, that have been introduced different times. Um, things that are intercepted like thrips and aphids and stuff that come in um, are eliminated before they can become established. And so we have those kind of successes. We have a robust, a pretty robust, considering how few of us are, a trapping program where like 20 to 40,000 traps get placed around the state for you know several dozen target species of insects that we look for. Uh, and we process all those potentially, I mean, in terms of all the insects that are collected, potentially millions of insects we go through in order to try to identify things that are here, get them as early as possible so there's a chance that we could eradicate them and get rid of them um, before they uh, can get a foothold and, and are permanent. Um, and then if, if all else fails, then we can end up doing um, 
maybe biocontrol sometimes uh, for pests that are concerned. Kind of a, a little segue here real quick. Uh, I mentioned Japanese beetle, we've kept it up for over 80 years, and that's the entire West. The entire West is banded together to keep Japanese beetle from getting established. We're kind of at risk right now. Um, southwest of Portland, we have a large Japanese beetle eradication going on right now that uh, if you're not aware of it already. And um, so uh, it, after the, the last recession, so this, oh, sorry, let's start over again. Uh, so we kind of feel like a, a minimum trapping level for Oregon is about 5,000 traps per year. And so at the last recession, you know, budget, budget cuts and, and uh, retractions, reductions, uh, our trapping amount got reduced all the way down to like about 2,500. And so that obviously meant that we were trapping fewer places. And so in that time period, um, after the, during the recession, uh, somebody moved from the east, um, brought their mom's roses or whatever plant, I don't really know, uh, planted in the yard and it had Japanese beetles in the soil and started to, to reproduce. So in 2016, when, when we finally got back to trapping in this area, as southwest of Portland there, um, there are 369 beetles, which we were shocked. That was more beetles than ever been collected in the state in the total before. And so we're like, oh my gosh, this is the biggest infestation ever. Unfortunately, then once we <clears throat> put out in a, um, delimitation traps, the next year it was over 20,000 specimens. And then, so then we know it was like a serious fight. So we, we've been under eradication for three years now. We have reduced the numbers, um, some, but not to the levels we want to. Last year we treated over 8,000 properties. And so we're hoping to beat this back. Um, we're still hopeful we can, but it would have big impacts. Uh, other states would quarantine plant shipments from outside, from inside or, and other commodities inside Oregon. Um, from being shipped out, uh, possibly it might be able it should be shipped with certain treatments and stuff like that. But it would impose costs, impose uh, additional treatments on plants that had to leave, leave here, or maybe even soil removal. Um, so we really would like to get this under control, and it's unfortunate that it worked out this way. But that's one of the problems when you're dealing with a forever problem. Um, you know, this is a, a short-term solution of saving, you know, tens of thousands, do tens of thousands of dollars in, um, in budget money, and now it's costing you know millions of dollars in eradication costs which could have funded this program, you know, $1 million could have funded this program easily for a decade or more. Um, so it's kind of frustrating that way. Anyway, I, I sorry for segueing, but I thought it's something that folks should be aware of. Um, but aside from our, our efforts at monitoring for pests, we also have uh, rules and regulations that we have. Um, and there's things like prohibitions on movement of snails into Oregon. Um, we have nursery stock, nursery stock has to be inspected. There's prohibitions on moving untreated firewood to the region. And we have things like the approved invertebrate list, Oregon approved invertebrate list. Um, a lot of other states have a prohibited list, like a blacklist, things that aren't allowed to be brought in the state. And when we looked at this, we thought our, that would be way too long of a list. And so what we did is we decided to have a list of things that were allowed to be shipped in the state, and by default, everything else is prohibited. And awareness of this has increased a lot, and I think it, it it's doing good things for us. Um, but we have you know, a number of rulemaking powers and things like that. And so those are difficult to measure their effects of what doesn't come in, but I think that those help protect the state as well. So in the context of this presentation today, I wanna to talk about invasive species and, and, their, and their establishment and, and movement in Oregon, and then at the federal level, because they're kind of two different things and we have a lot more control at the local level. So we'll start with, with the local, with Oregon. We'll start with Oregon. So, how did all the exotics that we get here, you know, we've been keeping track. How did those exotic species get um, get here? So you can kind of look at, you know, that list and you can kind of um, roughly estimate, you know, what is the likely life stage or and what, what by what means did those species come? So if you look at this little list here, um, you have raw wood, right? Something that would be boring in wood likely would have come in a log or, or um, solid wood packing material, about 9%. Um, just things that hitchhike, you know, like the brown marmorated stink bug or spider egg sacs and things like that, about 12%. So now if you think about aphids and mealybugs <clears throat> um, and some things like that, they, they really don't live off their plant in a significant way. So they really had to come with their plants. Uh, and then some things like some of the leaf miners and things that pupate in the soil um, that would end up being a soil that was closely associated with the plants. So then you get to like 79% of things that are like plants or soil, so are likely plant related which suggests that the movement of plants was a significant place, you know, like 80%, nearly 80% of the role in moving species here. And that makes sense. Oregon's a big nursery state. If you look at the little graph in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that since the 1990s, the nursery trade's been increasing a lot, crossed the $1 billion mark shortly before the, the recession. And since the recession, it's finally 
Uh, it takes a little while, but it's getting back over that one, into that $1 billion mark again. So we move a lot of plants in the state, and it's a risk that we need to recognize and consider. Um, as, you, as you remember before, we're considering uh, continuing to bring in this uh, uh, continual number of exotic species that are getting established in the state. Um, so, you know, these things can be moved through compost, they can move from soil, and these are all thing, examples of things in the picture that, of things that have been moved, by that means. Um, and then by plants, you know, and, 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 and so these things can be on the plants, they can inject their eggs, it can be very difficult to see um, associated with the plants. So the organ the part of agriculture, just to kind of summarize it sort of, you know, powers we have, we have rulemaking powers, you know, like I said, things like prohibiting snails being shipped to, to uh, Oregon. And included in that are quarantine powers, which in my time here we haven't really used, but we, we have the ability to quarantine different commodities from being moved here with pests, but we don't generally use it. And it's not quite as simple as it might seem on the, on the face of it. Uh, yeah, obviously we have education, um, and we get education about the pests, but you know, we're talking about hundreds of different species of pests, you know, the bandwidth of, of the audience that we have to receive that information and my ability to communicate all those, those species is really pretty difficult. You, know, the, you, you reach the level of pest exhaustion pretty quickly. Uh, I definitely have seen that in presentations I've given before where you get beyond like 15 species and people are like, oh my gosh, this is too much. And it is, it is too much for sure. Um, so there's a bandwidth issue there. So to me, the thing that makes the most sense is you, know, you kind of have to rely on people's experience to a certain extent of what they see and ask people to report risks and pests uh, that they see that seem new. And by risks, what I mean is, um, you know, if you go somewhere and someone's been uh, hard at work importing, you know, plant species from uh, Thailand and their whole yard is just filled with Thai Thailand plants or, um, I don't know, rocks from, you know, all these fancy rocks from China or something like that, uh, something that ha has some significant connection like that, you know, you, you could let us know um, it, that that could potentially pose a risk of importation of pests, it, and it, it often is. Um, and, and also with pests, so if you see something you've never seen before, you know, take a picture of it. It's easy enough if you send us a picture, um, just take a few moments that will, if it's a common thing, we'll be able to tell you pretty much right away. If it's an exotic thing, we can ask for it. And so hopefully, you know, you could take carry a little medicine vial or some kind of container with you and you can throw it in there. And then if we say it's something important, you can send it along, um, throw alcohol in it later. Uh, and we have lot, there's lots of different ways you communicate that. Um, you can call the Oregon Department of Agriculture and I'll put that number up later. Um, you can email us, uh, there's the Invasive Species Hotline. And there's also, if you go to the Oregon Department of Agriculture website and you um, look for identify an insect, it's in a little uh, bar on the left-hand side pretty easy to find actually and you can uh, include you can report uh, and something you find and uh, put a picture with it so I think that's probably the best way to report for the public anyway to report things like that it's the most efficient another thing we need to consider um, is we you know we need to use care extreme care when we're moving plants uh, grown outside of Oregon um, like I said I think uh, it seems like British Columbia, California, Florida, and New York are some of the, the, the highest risk places. They're some of the places that get somebody's pests first and then the things migrate out from there. Um, and so as we move stuff around, this is how it gets, it often gets here that way. Uh, so, you know, we should have higher standards about moving plants. You know, a lot of these pathogens, especially pathogens are extremely hard to see unless it's a susceptible host that really shows symptoms. Um, and a lot of these insects, they inject their eggs into the plant or maybe they're down in the soil. Uh, they can be very secretive, very difficult to detect. So, I mean, if you see signs of insect damage, you know, the leaves are disfigured, the plants deformed. Um, you got exuvi, which is the exoskeleton shed by the insects. Um, you know, it shows that insects had been, th that are there, maybe you can't see. Uh, you see slime trails on the plant, it suggests maybe a slug's hiding down in the pot. You know, we can, we can reject those things. We can say we want to, we want to, higher standard of cleanliness, but I don't want to bring these pests to my yard, to my neighborhood, and my community. Um, and the same thing applies to Oregon. There's a lot of pests that are just established, say, in Portland, or just established in Southern Oregon. And if we're moving plants around uh, carelessly, we're just going to help those things that would have taken a really long time to spread across the entire state to move across the state very quickly, or much more quickly. And so we talk, we, um, if we're talking about protecting the state, 
you know, and I talk about it, it being this risk from California and such. One of the things we don't have are border stations, I'm sure you've observed. In California does have border stations. Uh, Arizona and Florida also have border stations, but California has the most robust ones. We actually tried several years to go to, go to get some uh, border stations set up, but one of the problems is Oregon has very strong language in our constitution about uh, not stopping Oregon citizens for uh, without cause. And so just a general inspection station for just because they're passing through is not cause. And, uh, cause. So basically, the, the understanding is that we would have to change the uh, constitution in order to be able to have border stations in Oregon. So we think that's pretty unlikely, uh, unless just a whole bunch of people get really upset about it and get the legislation moving. Till that happens, we'll just have to kind of work around it, I guess. And so that's where we depend on, on our substantial surveys and other reporting we have. So we'll talk a little bit about the national situation. So nationally, they, they probably have the biggest impact of our overall risk of getting pests because if something gets established, like I said, in New York or well, any other state, once it's actually on our continent, the risk of it coming here is greatly increased than if it was in France and, and it had to cross the ocean. Um, so protecting our, our national borders is really important. Uh, come on, uh, come on. Uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection uh, are the ones that do the, most of the inspections at ports. Um, and so, for example, we have about and this is quite a bit of variability year to year in this, but 25 million containers come in the United States every year. And so less than 2% of those containers are actually physically inspected, even though probably the majority of them have, you know, say a solid wood pack packing material in the form of uh, pallets and things like that. Um, and I do see numbers sometimes as up to almost 4% being inspected, and maybe that's possible. Anyway, regardless, it's a pretty small amount. We're pretty much dependent upon the, um, the manifest of those containers coming into the country. Um, to detect pests or to anticipate pests. Um, but live in plant imports are, are probably our number one pathway. There was a I, I strongly encourage you to hunt out this paper. It's a really interesting one. I could send it to, to folks if they were interested. Um, it's Liebhold et al. came out in 2012. Um, they looked at the data for plant imports and they found in 2007 that over 3 billion plants were brought into the country, Three live, 3 billion live plants. And we were all really shocked. If you had asked me before this paper came out how many plants were being imported in the country, I'd been like, well, because of the high level of scrutiny they're going to require, it can't be much more than 50,000 plants. They have to be really high value plants. I was very naive. Um, and then also in that same paper, they talk about in 2010, looking at the data for inspectors and the, the workload they had. Each was, inspector was responsible for 43 million plants in that year. 43 million plants uh, per person. So if you break that out in a 40 hour work week, you know, if you assume a 40 hour work week, no vacation, and all they're doing is looking at plants, it's like 373 plants per minute. And so those, those, uh, the picture down below of those, of those folks, it's just because they're kind of like exhausted zombies because they're looking at some of these plants. Um, you know, we, at 3 billion plants, even though if there's a, with each plant, if there's a really low risk of bringing in a disease or a pathogen, at 3 billion plants, even though the odds are low, we've made it so that it's very likely that we're gonna bring in pests. Um, just because of the odds um, when you when you deal with numbers like that. Um, and so now in retrospect, we're like, well, obviously, this is why we're constantly seeing these, these new species come in, because we're just bringing in so many plants and the risk is so high. Um, so uh, there are a lot of uh, regulations um, involved in international trade. And the United States is signatory to a number of uh, international agreements. So one of the things is um, the National Pest Advisory Group. If a new pest is detected in the United States um, and, and it goes to the proper channels, the new pest, National Pest Advisory Group, MPAG, um, will do kind of like a pest risk assessment on it. You know, what, what, is it potentially a pest to our agriculture or our forests and those sorts of things? And then they make a recommendation as to whether this pest is regulated or not. And usually those suge that, that suggestion is taken. Uh, and states can submit comments on this, and we usually do. Why is this important? Um, so deregulated pests are not allowed to be stopped at ports. So basically by the international agreements we have, if, it's, if a pest is deregulated, then it cannot be stopped at a port. What this means is, so say a pest gets established in Florida, which has happened many times, and, and it, the pest is deregulated, now all the rest of the ports in the country, including like say Oregon, California, and Washington, even though we're far, far away, have to let it in. The ports can no longer stop it anymore. The requirements for, for regulation, for continued regulation, are you know, they appear fairly simple. Um, 
there must be an effort to control or eradicate that thing, say that's in Florida, and there must be survey involved just so we know where it is. Those cost money and time, and there's a lot of pests out there. And so it's actually, in some ways, a kind of high bar. And so you might say, well, this is the international regulation. It's standardizing everything for all the countries. Uh, so we're all subject to the same rules. It's true. It's, it is good that we all, you know, we have to do, we have to do these things or else we have to deregulate. Um, so there are good aspects to it, but it's not necessarily, the way it's set up doesn't seem appropriate. So if you look at this map, see there's really big countries like the United States and Russia and Brazil and Australia and Canada. And there are smaller countries, you know, that mean and, and median countries are both somewhere around Britain, maybe a little smaller. So it's not really fair in the sense that uh, we're treating them all the same. And here's, a, here's an example. That big bl black blotch up there is the, the silhouette of Germany. So the pest gets established in Germany and they're not doing anything about it, so they have to deregulate it. Um, I mean, you can probably make arguments as to why that isn't appropriate, but it's a much different thing than, you know, where Germany is the size of Montana, if the pest gets established in North Carolina or, or, or Florida or something, uh, it's a much different thing in the United States. It's a, we're a much larger country. The European Union deregulates country by country. In the, in the United States, we technically deregulate by our uh, continental United States. And so it really seems like it would make a lot more sense to, you know, say deregulate by state or have some kind of regional system set up. Seems like that'd be more appropriate and fair in terms of world trade, because now we're putting the whole country at risk of getting these pests. And I mean, part of the problem is in terms of changing this is that a lot of these groups um, that are being deregulated like, are like aphids or things like that, or thrips or something that aren't, are kind of discounted as important pests. They're just, it's another thrips, uh, it's just other thrips. But what we forget is that they, these costs um, that are involved are forever. You know, these pests are here forever. The costs that, that a grower or someone that's trying to control them is, are gonna be forever costs as opposed to, you know, like. Um, the, the, the eradicate, you know, compared to the eradication costs, which would, would be relatively short term. Um, and these costs are, the, the, these pests are additive, you know, you might say that, oh, it's just another aphid, but all these aphids, they're different species and they have different things. They have different host ranges, they have different tolerances for climates, they have different abilities to transmit pathogens. So they're not just, it's just not just another aphid, it's another additional thing that does something different um, and poten has potential in different regions to be a pest, potentially. Um, and also what we've seen uh, with a lot of these kind of secondary pests, these things that have been discounted is um, in forestry. So these pests have actually, um, these hot uh, drought years are actually causing a, a reduction in the, the distribution of some of our, some of our trees, um, because essentially it's like these trees are leaking and, and uh, um, are therefore can't resist drought as well. So they can have uh, unanticipated consequences. Um, so, you know, for a lot of these rules, you know, it's kind of like, well, it'd be really nice to have leadership that was willing to challenge some of these treaties and, and, and take a risk at making some of these changes, which maybe we do right now. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see, you know, the, change these rules, change these, these trade agreements so that uh, the United States isn't disadvantaged in this particular case. And there are other uh, international rules that are, are confusing to me. I don't really understand why they are the way they are, since it's um, pretty obvious that they could be fixed. One is the Canadian user fee rule. And it's an interesting one in that with fruits and vegetables grown in Canada, if they come to the border and a pest is found there uh, and it can't be identified, the fruits and vegetables are required to be let through. And then that, that, that pest is, is shipped along uh, to our identifiers for identification. But because of the, the nature of how that's done, uh, they're given a lower priority rating. So it could potentially take months for the identification, identification to occur. And by that time, the, the, the product, the vegetables or fruits are already probably sold. Um, so it's a really weird rule. I don't know where it came from. Another one that may be more important to me is ISPM 15. Um, this is kind of in that same group that, that um, deals with the regulation of pests. Um, but this is for wood boring insects, for the treatment of wood that's, that's being shipped internationally. Uh, and generally, it's a heat treatment oftentimes, and it has an official stamp that goes with it. Well, when, the, when this was first envisioned, you know, this is a scientific question. How can we be sure that wood, you know, has a, you know, we have a 99% confidence that this wood doesn't have uh, a living insect pest in it? Um, you could, you could do that scientifically. You determine what what the treatment levels would be. But unfortunately, it, it's it hasn't worked out that way. You know, this is a kind of a political issue as well, and it's lots of complications. Um, we've ended up, you know, research has shown that it's probably reduced the number of pests moving in wood by about half. But we still figure there's 10,000 containers um, being brought in the United States that have viable wood boring pests in them every year. 
And so uh, part of the problem is that these, the data was based on um, emerald ash borer, which just bores under the bark. Uh, it doesn't get very deep in the wood, and there are lots of wood bores that actually kind of go into the center of the wood, um, amongst other issues. And so that's something that could be fixed. There's the boomerang effect, as, as we call it here anyway. And this is the idea, you talk about if this pest isn't regulated, it can't be stopped at ports, right? Well, our native species also get moved to other countries and become pests. Um, when, when they're there, like say the wood borers, a lot of them are associated with fungi and other pathogens. If they come back here, technically they, they shouldn't be stopped. They're not regulated pests and they would be allowed th through if they were identified. So that's a, a potential risk pathway that, that exists, a kind of a loophole, as it were. You know, these are things that worry us. I don't, you know, it's, it's hard. It, it, they're pretty high up. It's hard to imagine um, the amount of effort that would be required to, to raise this to the level of to get above the noise that would be in Washington, D.C. To, to get action on these things sometimes. And so another thing I often hear from people is, you know, like, well, don't we, I mean, all the bad pests have moved around. There's not any more bad pests, you know, serious pests that we can get. Well, if, if you're, you know, been an adult since 2009, you probably remember that before 2009, pretty much all of our berries, there weren't a lot of major pests in our region for, for all of our berries, except for maybe cherries. And that most of them could be organic. Um, and then the spotted wing drosophila arrived and spread, you know, it, it showed up in California in 2008, uh, it was detected in, in Oregon in 2009, and then almost immediately spread all over around, around the state. And it greatly increased the number of pesticide treatments that were used. Um, basically, if you're, not, if you're eating um, uh, berries that aren't treated, um, then you're most likely eating maggots. And they're not going to hurt you, but this thing is a very widespread and a uh, very um, able pest. And so definitely there's more pests like that out in the world. This was a good, and that was a big surprise. No one anticipated this pest here in the United States. Anyway, and, and it's kind of an example. We have a hundred, this is kind of an internal um, working list, um, but we have our hundred worst invertebrate list that we work from to try to plan and, and anticipate pests. And there are hundreds of other species that kind of don't make the hundred worst list, but we're still consider. And there are potentially thousands of other species that, that could be risked. And you know there are millions, there's a, over a million described insect species in the world, and there's potentially millions of undescribed species in the world. So there's no limit um, really on the number of species we can get here in the, in the near term. And you might be aware of this. I always find this an interesting uh, group. So you know, people do associate slugs like the banana slug with Oregon. We have 29 species of slugs in Oregon, and um, 16 of those are exotic species of slugs, all European. So more than half of our slugs are exotic species. All the pests are exotic uh, that you deal with in your yard that are damaged your plants. And we may have had, um, I, I, I do believe I found one new European species this spring in a survey. Uh, wasn't one that I had really anticipated. Aria and Fuscus there, see they're all greeting them. They're very excited to see them. Um, so I, I don't think we have any other group like this where more than half of all the species of a group are, are the exotic species and many of them pests. And we brought them all here ourselves. Um, things that are on our radar are the kinds of things that are on our radar. Uh, allium, you know, this is onions, garlic, uh, leeks, things like that. You know, we have a big uh, allium industry in Oregon. Um, but uh, it's obviously a big part of our, the way we cook, and so everyone's got it in their gardens. Um, Phytos, uh, Phytomyza gymnostoma, the allium leaf miner, was detected in Pennsylvania in 2016. 2016. It is the worst allium pest in Europe. Um, and so it was quickly found in that year in 16 counties in Pennsylvania, and now it's in New Jersey, now it's probably in New York, and it was deregulated in 2017. We've talked about what that means. And so now this thing's out there uh, and spreading around. Uh, California very quickly put a quarantine up. There are, there's a program um, called, people refer to as Free Stamp, um, where the USDA will continue, or the uh, CBP will continue to stop these pests at ports. And so California has uh, set up one of those with them and but all alone. They did it all by themselves, which is kind of funny since if it gets established in Oregon, they'll be at really high risk. Um, we're, we're working on getting our own with, in a conjunction uh, with Washington and Idaho because as a group, it makes more sense to protect ourselves. Um, and so we, we do have actually the, a protection at our ports uh, kind of temporarily while the paperwork's being done uh, against this pest. But still there's a risk of it being moved within the United States. Uh, the European cherry fruit, fruit fly. So if you're familiar with the Western uh, cherry fruit fly, that's a major pest for cherries in the, in the in Western United States. This is a very similar pest in Europe. 
Um, the timing of it, we expect to be differently, maybe a few weeks off and we're in overposits in the cherry, so it might require another pesticide treatment for cherries. We don't, we don't really know until it gets here, unfortunately. Um, it got established in 2016 in Canada, and it was found in 2017 in New York, New York State. Um, so now this is moving around. This is still under federal quarantine, so Oregon can't quarantine it itself, and hopefully the federal quarantine will work to, to restrain its movement. And it also means since it's under federal quarantine, the ports um, are still regulated for the species. But it's another pest that we're watching for, and it could have an impact on cherry growing here. Kind of hesitated to put this one in here, um, but I think it's a really good example of, of the way we move things around and the risk that we kind of don't, don't think about every day. So the, the rat lungworm is this um, parasitic nematode that lives in slugs. Uh, when a mouse or a rat eats a slug or a snail, and it has the nematodes. The, the nematodes migrate into it, uh, from its digestive tract into its lungs. It coughs it up and then, you know, kind of hoops it out. Um, and then a slug or snail eats the, the rat feces and, you know, then you get a whole cycle there between that. Well, if other vertebrates eat the slug or snail, um, by accident or on purpose, for some reason in other vertebrates, it seems like they, they get the nematodes get confused and go to the brain. So that causes brain damage and inflammation and death potentially. Um, and so unfortunately this has gotten established in, in uh, the United States. Uh, it was found in Louisiana, uh, I think as early as 98, might be, might be actually be quite a bit earlier than that. Um, and in 2003 in Florida in a zoo, and then in 2014, Alabama and Texas. The California one's kind of a weird one. It's not known to be established in California. That was actually a zoo where they were feeding this some kind of predatory bird, lizards from, they were importing from Asia and they think the nematodes were in the lizards. Anyway, we don't know what it's established in California, but it's certainly concerning. Uh, 2015, it was found in Oklahoma. And um, so a lot of these invasive species, they take a long time, it's, you know, some of them might be pests right away. Some of them might take a decade or many decades to really become pests. Um, this thing's been established in, in, in Hawaii for, um, since the 1950s. And only in the last decade or so really has it started having significant, where humans are actually getting it and having medical problems or dying uh, from it. So it took time. And the idea is that it seems to be home gardens and the, the assumption is that they're accidentally leaving small slugs in the produce that they grow in the gardens. Although there, it's not exactly clear where there's potential that the, it's in the slime uh, that might be left on. And if you don't clean up the slime well enough off the, off the produce that it could affect them. So this is like kind of a pretty scary thing. I mean, obviously it's not a huge number of people are being affected, but the, the, the consequences are large. Climate's not a barrier. There's a population that's been established now in Britain and now in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know if it was last year or the year before. Uh, we, have, we have hosts of this thing that live here already. Um, and you know, like we talk about for all these invasive species things, uh, once established, they're here forever. And so I, you know, I kind of look at, at our region where we get a lot of food, like this kind of food culture where we want to have organic things and eat lots of fresh food and stuff like that. And it seems like if this was widely established, um, it would pose unusual risk to us. And so uh, this thing's on the move to the country and it's something to be concerned about. And so I do apologize if it scares people unduly. But basically the bottom line is keeping pets out is only a sure way to keep them out and keep them, you know, getting from them getting established in a state. Once they're here and we're doing eradication, then it's kind of more of a gamble, right? We don't know if we're gonna be able to eradicate them for sure. So that, that's the holy grail there. An exclusion is the, the holy grail. And so a lot of that, that starts at the federal level, but you know, also the state level, um, you know, if we had more control. So in terms of, uh, you know, what, what can you do? And what am I asking for from you? Um, so locally, you know, we can take more care using plants. We can have higher standards for moving plants, be careful about moving plants. Um, and think about that when we, when we move things from different places, we're potentially moving a pest that, that we don't want. Um, you can support uh, efforts to eradicate pests. You know, there's a lot of pressure these days to reduce pesticide use, and that's understandable, right? But our eradications are often not considered um, in these circumstances, whereas if we have a small eradication in a small area, is a, a kind of a, a small pesticide use uh, for a short period of time, Otherwise, the thing is established, and regardless of whether you use pesticides or not, some of your neighbors are likely to. And so then you have this more broad, chronic use of pesticides to control this pest over the long term in the state. So it actually is, I would argue, a long-term reduction in pest eradications. But if you're gonna, if we're gonna ban, say, aerial spraying over an area, you know, we need to consider eradications and, and, and 
write in a loophole so that we can still deal with these invasive species issues. And the other thing you can do, like we talked about before, is reporting suspicious pests. Um, and I think that, that is a little more abstract is, you know, you contact your legislators, your, your legislator, your, your representatives and say, yeah, I support efforts to monitor and eradicate invasive species because they don't hear that very often. Um, and so they don't, aren't generally thinking about these issues. Nationally, I know this, it's a much bigger reach, much bigger ask. It's hard to get above all the noise and all the things that are happening there. Um, but if they hear about more about it at all, that's it's a great thing because they probably don't really hear about invasive species at all. But, you know, push for higher uh, science supported standards for um, importing like the wood, the wood, um, the ISPM 15 standards. Um, we really need to increase our inspection of containers. You know, we need a lot of those resources, inspect containers, inspect plants better um, and support nationwide surveys for these pests so that we can keep them regulated. And I do realize there's things we need to do. We, we, we better communicate these new pests, um, but there's a lot of them. Um, but, and we need to uh, communicate these, these barriers that we might have to protecting the state. And how we do that, I mean, there's so much information to communicate, so many different pests. Sometimes I feel like I'm just, you know, I'm gonna overwhelm everybody if we, if we do this. And so finding better ways to communicate, finding the right amount of communication, those are real challenges. So I'm hoping I can get people to make some noise. I can get folks active on these issues. And people maybe will have an idea, ideas on, you know, what's the best way to communicate? What, what is the most efficient way to communicate? How much information is the right amount? And how can we get the, the attention of lawmakers? And that's really mostly all I had. Um, I'll kind of end on this. We have, if you go odaguides.us, we have some neat things that have come out of the lab for identifying bees, stink bugs, and slugs, and some posters and things like that. Really great images from our folks here. Um, and so, if you see something, feel free to report it. I guess if we have time for questions, and we can do that. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. We're all depressed. We've got to go out in our gardens now and <laughs> sell some flowers. We need a slug, end it all. <laughs> a slug. Be careful with the slugs. Um, so while folks are thinking about their questions, and remember, please use the Q&A box. That'll help us keep track, and if we're not able to answer them all, um, today, it provides us a record that Josh can follow up if, if needed. Um, there were a lot of links and things that Josh put uh, or mentioned during his presentation. I put some of them in the chat box. I'm also going to collect them all and you'll get, they'll, they'll either be in the email that you'll get or I'll put them on that landing page, that extension learn site so that you have access to them. So don't worry about trying to grab those links. Um, and so we're still planning for our next series of webinars and probably taking July off and then starting back in August with at least four more to round out this year. Um, and it looks like we have a couple questions going in. And so um, and some of them might be more comments. So if it's sort of a comment, I might, you know, we'll, we'll answer that offline. Um, so uh, Josh, so Nancy has a question about um, biocontrols and the potential for um, thinking about introducing a biocontrol is a good thing and then it ends up becoming a pest. Um, are there examples of that or is that something that the ODA works on? Yeah, so, um, so remember that the, our approved in, uh, invertebrate list. So yeah, so, so we prohibit ones that aren't on that list from being imported. And um, you know, a lot of those things that are biocontrols are generalist predators, and so they could have impacts on our native species. And since we don't know what those are, we don't want to just allow, allow people to bring stuff in willy-nilly. There's a really good example. Um, if you guys are familiar with gorse, which is a really horrible weed, mostly in southwestern Oregon, you know, it's like huge and spiny. It was a really good biocontrol agent um, that years ago, I guess it's probably 15 years ago, or maybe longer, um, that we thought was going to be that they thought was going to be the answer to controlling this this thing, but we had a, a biocontrol mite that had gotten established here, and it completely wiped out the spider mite that's very specific to gorse, and basically completely eliminated that potential biocontrol. Now I don't know whether we could restrict you know stop that particular thing from being brought in, but there are a lot of predators out in the world, and that we don't necessarily need to bring them all in um, to to solve you know a problem, whether that's you know. Uh, wasps to control flies and manure and stuff like that. Sometimes maybe the best way is just to do manure control or something like that. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
So uh, Deborah has a question about, um, so as gardeners, sometimes we'll be ordering plants in from other states. So there is a lot of movement, you know, even at the garden level of moving plants in from uh, other states or moving within the state. But her question is about, she's ordering plants from a nursery in another state. Um, it might come with some inspection paperwork and she wants to know, like, can, can she trust it? Like what, what goes into that uh, inspection process? Well, that's, that would vary state by state, right? So that each state is inspecting it as it leaves. And so their standards and their abilities probably vary quite a bit state by state. Um, so can you trust it? Um, I mean, to an extent, yeah. I mean, it's, it's probably not going to be, hopefully not going to be a really obvious pests on it. But I, I would say there's such a volume of plants moving, and especially some of the things are difficult to see. You know, like some of the scales, you know, they look like little bud scars or something like that. Or, you know, some of the things just aren't obvious. Uh, we all have ants, like an ant colony established in the soil of the plant. Um, so I would say that it's still on the, the consumer, on the person uh, that is, is buying that plant. You know, you're bringing this to your yard, you're bringing this to your house. You know, you're, you're going to be the first line of defense and the first place affected. Um, so, you know, reinspect that plant, look for stuff. And if, if you see that it's full of scales or some kind of mite or something like that, I, I totally support returning it to the, the sender and, you know, that's going to have an economic impact on them and hopefully it'll cause that nursery to send out cleaner stuff. Um, um, and Sean had sort of a similar question about the uh, house plants and like tropical plants have become really popular. And so there's a lot of movement and you can sort of mail order things or you can, you know, do trades and people, you know, buy something off of eBay, right? And then someone will send you a plant in the mail. Um, is any of that sort of regulated, that sort of person-to-person -person shipping? Um, They're technically regulated, um, but really hard to enforce, right? The internet is a big challenge for us um, because, especially for like private sellers, of small, small groups or, or just kind of these trades, um, we, we would prefer to have those inspected. Um, but, the, you know, shipping stuff by mail, it can easily get by and not be seen. Um, and it definitely poses a risk. We definitely know that lots of pet, or the pets have come here that way before. And so, yeah, it's definitely a risk. Um, just because something's tropical too, doesn't, you know, and you're like, well, this is a temperate place. It can't get established. The Willamette, Willamette Valley, Western Oregon is a weird place. You know, we're, we're, um, we're temperate, but yet really pretty mild. And so, you know, you go outside, you can see bananas growing outside. You can see almonds growing outside. You can see um, olives growing outside. So kind of these warm, temperate, um, plants growing out, out there and just because the insects sometimes aren't, aren't as susceptible as the plants and so they can get established here and be pests for other things. So yeah, I'd still say always be vigilant. There's so many things moving around. Yeah. Um, Rhonda has a, a question. So you had mentioned this top 100 worst invertebrates list. Um, is that something that is publicly available or is that something that you use sort of internally at the Department of Agriculture for decision making? Yeah, it's more of an, inter I mean, right now it's an internal, like kind of a functional list for us to try to plan our surveys and figure out where we want to target our survey efforts. I would like it to make it eventually uh, available. It's not going to have pictures. It's too long. And most of the things aren't, we don't have pictures of, we'd, we'd have to go online and steal the pictures away. Um, but yeah, I would like to make that list available. And if someone wants, I could send it informally if someone's interested in just looking at it. Um, it doesn't have any official standing or anything. Mm -hmm. And I would like to make it available so just so people can think about the huge array of things that we're facing. Right. Um, and we have some viewers that are from out of state. And so I just want to maybe ask you to sort of clarify what services um, that Oregon offers. And then also the uh, identify a pest or identify an insect link. This isn't just for like your standard run of the mill garden pests for that they might come to master gardeners, but this is for something that's like elevated, like a higher level, correct? Yeah, yeah. So the, the identify a pest, I mean, if you, I guess if you submit regular old garden variety pests as it were, um, you know, we'll probably identify them. But yeah, the, the real intent is to try to get, you know, if you feel like you're seeing something you've never seen before or something you're worried about as a new invasive, that, that's really the target, you know, the targeted goal for that um, is to get those kinds of things submitted. Yeah, uh, OSU Extension has offices around and means to, to 
delicate things where you're looking for help controlling pests in your garden. That's not really something that's a strong skill set for us. I mean, we'll, tr we'll do our best, but um, that's something that we really is part of our regular job. And that's primarily for within Oregon, because you're Oregon. Yeah. Um, We're mostly concerned with Oregon. I mean, obviously, if you're from another state and you feel like you don't have resources and you feel like you've got something that's new to North America or something like that, then that would be good to know. And that certainly could potentially happen. Mm -hmm. But maybe first have them check with their state department of agriculture to see if there's a similar, and it might be named something different too, folks. Like if you're from another state, it might not be, um, you know, the insect pest prevention <laughs> management group. Probably. So you might have to ask and see who the best person is to, to contact. Um, I, there's a couple questions about those. Uh, it's like, I think it's the, pre the slide you had just before this one, those ODA guides. Um, how, so where can people get those? The ones of like the stink bugs and the bees and slugs, those um, guides. So we have a lot of master gardeners listening that do teaching and do, you know, talk about insects. And so this would be a really good educational tool. Yeah. Um, so those are, so if you go to the, the ODA um, guides.us, those, you can order the posters and stuff from us just basically for shipping. If you want to get a whole bunch to give away, I don't know. Um, to some extent, we might be able to support that depending on what it was, but mostly that the files are available or we can make them available where you could go and have them printed for yourselves. The booklets, like the booklets, um, are pretty substantial printing things. Um, and so, so that's available that way. So you could, you, those files, we can make those files available for printing if you want. Okay. I'll, maybe I'll follow up with you offline and then we'll get that information and we'll put the link to where people can download what's already available um, for folks. Um, let's see. So we just were actually kind of right at our time. Um, there was kind of one big question that came in. Maybe we could end on that one. Sean has a question about, um, and maybe you can't answer this one. It might be out of your, out of your area of specialty, but he's kind of has a general question about climate change and invasive species and having them maybe either be uh, more apt to be established in our area or be moving around differently. Have you seen any sort of trends like that at all about? Well, so I mean, in terms of entomology, we definitely see the effects of climate change on pests moving around. You know, like they have the, even our native species are attacking trees at higher and higher levels, uh, say uh, yeah, elevation wise, because the, the freeze line is, is raising and so trees like some of those white pines and stuff like that are really old are getting attacked more and more um, where they hadn't been before um, by pests. But yeah, it definitely, um, as it gets warmer, our risk for different kinds of pests getting here um, likely increases. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, so we're at our time. I want to um, make sure our speaker can get on to the rest of his day. Uh, I want to just thank everybody for attending. And again, you'll be receiving um, an email if you've registered for this that will have... Um, some links and then once the recording is available that will be all kind of compiled into a single email um, and we really appreciate everything and thank you so much Josh you can't hear us all clapping but we're all clapping uh, <laughs> quietly and we will um, I'll send out an email when the next webinar is available all right thanks everybody thanks Bye. Josh. thanks Bye.